Well, we're in our next sermon, and the last of our series. It reminds me, after listening restlessly to a long and boring, tedious sermon, a six-year-old boy asked his father what the preacher did the rest of the week. Oh, he's a very busy man, the father replied. He takes care of church business. He visits the sick. He works on his sermon. He counsels people who are hurting. And then he has to have time to rest up because giving a sermon is not an easy job. The boy thought for a moment and then said, well, listening ain't so easy either. <laughs> Why are some of you nodding? That's, that has me concerned. Over the last three months together, we have been looking at an often overlooked portion of Scripture, at the 12 minor prophets. And again, it, it truly, if you add up all the pages, all the chapters, it's one-sixth of the entire Bible, but most folks don't include it in their reading schedule. And today we're finally completing our study of the last of the minor prophets. And if you want to find the book, the today's study is in the book of Malachi. If you want to find that book, it's fairly easy. Go to the book of Matthew and go back a chapter. That's the book of Malachi. A little background. We remember the 12 prophets. And we were looking over the last several months at these 12 prophets, broken into four groups of three prophets each, to make it a little easier, the first three were uh, part of, uh, uh, of the prophets that were actually designed to reach out to the Gentile nations, not to the Jewish nations, but to the Gentile nations. And then we remember that after Solomon died, that the kingdom broke into two parts. Ten tribes to the north broke away from the two tribes to the south. We had three prophets who dealt with the northern kingdom, and they were captured and, and overrun by uh, the Assyrians. And then we had three prophets that dealt with the southern kingdom, and they eventually were conquered by Babylon. And uh, the Bible says, uh, predicted, and as was true to form, um, there were 70 years of exile before they were allowed entry back home. And with the aid of the prophets we read earlier, Haggai and Zechariah in the last couple of weeks, the temple was rebuilt. It began in 536 B.C., there was a long pause of 20 years, but by 516 B.C., the temple was, was built. 18 years later, the first of three more groups came, and it was a group of exiles returned to Jerusalem that were led by Ezra, a priest. His work was to teach the people the word of God. And then about 444 B.C., 14 years after Ezra's exiles arrived, a third group of exiles returned, led by Nehemiah, who eventually became their governor, and under his leadership, the walls of Jerusalem were rebuilt. Together with Ezra, he led the people to a great revival as well. He was a contemporary of Ezra and Nehemiah, this prophet Malachi. His name, we find out, reads, My Messenger, but that's about all we know about him except that God raised him up with a specific task in mind. God's people, you see, were disappointed. They were discouraged. They had returned to the promised land and had rebuilt the temple in Jerusalem. They replanted their fields and, and life just still wasn't going very well for them. Their zeal had fizzled. Their faith had turned an empty formalism, if you will. Their spirituality was sloppy and their religion was re, uh, ritualistic and hollow. And Malachi was the messenger that God sent to his people. But Malachi, named my messenger, also spoke of God's messengers to come. Malachi 3, verse 1 said, I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. And then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant, who, a covenant whom you desire will come, said the Lord Almighty. Like Ezra the priest, Malachi attacked the spiritual and moral decay that was common among both the priests and the people of the day. In doing so, though, he also introduced a new style of teaching the Israelites had never experienced before. It was known as the didactic or dialectic method, which later became common in the Jewish schools and the synagogues. We find it a lot in the New Testament, especially in the, in the letters from Paul that uses this method. And the method is this. First, it makes a charge. Then it raises potential objections that the listener or reader may have. And then it refutes them one by one. So it's a, a, an apologetics uh, style of teaching, if you will. And in this book, Malachi is going to bring up six separate charges. 
And I think it's important that as we look at these charges, that we could say they are charges that we ourselves are guilty of even today. And so the book, as with every one of the minor prophets, is just as important for us to study today as it was for the original intended readers and back then. The first charge that he raises up is doubting God's love. I think it's important to recognize here, he doesn't start out with guilt. He doesn't say, you're guilty of this or you're guilty of that. Rather, he begins with a relationship problem between the people and their God. You know, sometimes we artificially separate our Bible into two Testaments, the Old Testament and New Testament. We separate God along with the Testaments. We say the Old Testament is the book of the law. The New Testament is the book of, the, of love. But in reality, we need to remember that God's love is a part of his very character. And we see it through Scripture, whether it's in Genesis or Revelation, and everywhere in between. Listen to these verses from the Older Testament, if you will. Isaiah 43, 4, since you are precious and honored in my sight and because I love you, it says. Jeremiah 31, 3, I have loved you, my people, with an everlasting love. With an unfailing love, I've drawn you to myself. And finally, in Zephaniah, a book we just read recently, 3.17, the Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. See, God's love is, is totally unique. God's love is eternal. Second Thessalonians 2.13 says, But we ought always to thank God for you, brothers loved by the Lord, because from the very beginning, God chose you to be saved through the sanctifying work of the Spirit and through belief in his truth. God's love is eternal. God's love is unconditional. God's love is very personal. Philip Yancey wrote a, a, a best-selling book called What's So Amazing About Grace. I love this line from it. There is nothing we can do to make God love us more. And there is nothing we can do to make God love us even less. Malachi 1 keeps going, I have loved you, says the Lord, but you ask, how have you loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord? Yet I have loved Jacob, but Esau I have hated. And I have turned his hill country into a wasteland and left his inheritance to the desert jackals. Now the word love here is in the perfect sense. It means that God not only loved in the past, but he, he loved even now. We could say it this way, God said, I have loved and I continue to love you. And the word he chooses for love is not the typical Old Testament term that we find the love, like a tough love or a covenant love. Instead, the word God uses here is a lot more relational. I have embraced you. I have expressed my affection for you, says the Lord. Also notice, again, that didactic style I was talking about earlier. He brings up the charge. The charge is, I have loved you after all. And then the question, well, in what way have you loved us? And then he answers it, was not Esau Jacob's brother, yet Jacob I have loved and Esau I have hated. Evidently, they were questioning God's love for them. See, after years of captivity, one might, one might understand a little bit of why they felt that way. Their return from Babylonian captivity was not without difficulty every step of the way. Isaiah, in verse, uh, chapter 16, verse 5, had prophesied that the population would swell to a mighty throng of people and all nations would come and serve them. And yet here they were, still pretty small. They were still under the power of Persia. What they didn't realize and what the prophet Haggai had pointed out was that their disobedience was what was keeping them from their blessings. The people may have thought they were just complaining privately, but they were demonstrating their utter disbelief publicly, and he knew it. I read about a college student who had arrived early for the college chapel service. He looked at the order of the service, and he groaned out loud. A middle-aged woman sat next to him and asked him what was wrong. The student replied, it, it's the preacher. I, I've got him for Bible class, and he's a nice guy and all, but he is the dullest man alive. He's totally boring. The woman looked at him and said, young man, do you know who I am? The student looked at her and said he didn't. Well, said the woman, I'm that man's wife. To which the student said faintly, do you know who I am? No, said the preacher's wife. Hallelujah, the student exclaimed and ran out the door. <laughs> and that's kind of the way the people were. The people were sharing the, their disbelief, their, their, their uh, disbelief in God and his ways and his justice. 
and they were doing so publicly. And God, is in, his, in his answer, brings up Jacob and Esau. And we don't have time to go over the whole story, but you may recall that Jacob and Esau were twins and that Jacob honored and blessed Jacob rather than Esau. But God is not speaking here of Jacob and Esau, the individuals. He's speaking of Jacob, which became the land of Israel. And he's speaking of Esau, which became the land of Edom. And he's talking about hating what Edom as a nation had become. You may remember our very first study of these 12 minor prophets was Obadiah and how Obadiah prophesied to the land of Edom. The Edom had refused to allow Moses' passage after the Israelites left Egypt. They were cousins, remember. These were two brothers and their descendants, uh, the descendants of Esau, not allowing the descendants of Jacob to pass through. Over the years, many of Israel's kings would fight wars with their cousins, the Edomites. Edom did not offer to help Judah when the Babylonians attacked them. And Edom even looted Jerusalem after she was destroyed. And Malachi goes on to illustrate what he means, that God loved Jacob and hated Esau. Edom may say, though we have been crushed, we will rebuild the ruins. But this is what the Lord Almighty says. They may build, but I will demolish. They will call, be called the wicked land, a people always under the wrath of the Lord. You will see it with your own eyes and say, great is the Lord, even beyond the borders of Israel. Edom, the descendants of Esau, had become desolate. Despite their claims to the contrary, it would remain desolate, according to this prophecy. But Israel would one day see the Lord magnified beyond their borders. If the people had only observed how Israel was being restored while Edom remained desolate, they would know that God still loved them as a nation. How many times do we go through life seeing the things that are crushing in around us and going, where are you, God? But we need to remember that God has always loved us. God is always with us. No matter what we're going through, God is always there. You see, their doubting of God's love had led to another problem that was prevalent at their time, and that's the second charge that Malachi brings against the people, dishonoring God's name. He goes on in verse 6 and 7, A son honors his father and a slave his master. If I'm a father, where's the honor due me? If I'm the master, where's the respect that's due me, says the Lord Almighty? It's you priest who show contempt for my name. But you ask, how have we shown contempt for your name? by offering defiled food on my altar. But you ask, how have we defiled you? See, sons honor their father. I want to make sure that's pointed out to those that are in the congregation. But sons honor their father. Servants honor their masters. But they were despising God. And when asked in what way, they were told of their defiled sacrifices to God. They were making sacrifices. They were defiled. Verse 7, by saying that the Lord's table, is his altar, is contemptible. When you offer blind animals for sacrifice, isn't that wrong? When you sacrifice lame or diseased animals, is that not wrong? Try offering them to your governor. Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you, says the Lord God Almighty? So they were sacrificing, but instead of sacrificing what they were supposed to, the best of their flock, the first of their flock, they were taking the blind, the diseased, and the lame. They were useless to them anyway. I give them to God. He'll like them. He'll take them. And he's saying you are defiling your sacrifice. You're defiling the altar. You are defiling my name. They were offering to God what they would be embarrassed to give man. The Lord would even wish that someone shut the doors so they couldn't sacrifice. Verse 10, Oh, that one of you would shut the temple doors so that you would not light useless fires on my altar. I am not pleased with you, said the Lord Almighty, and I will accept no offering from your hands. My name will be great among the nations from where the sun rises to where it sets. In every place incense and pure offerings will be brought to me because my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord Almighty. Despite their dishonor, despite their, their displeasing of God, the defiling sacrifices, one day God's name would be great even among the Gentiles as well as the Israelites. Verse 12, but you profane it by saying the Lord's table is defiled, its food is contemptible. And you say, what a burden, and you sniff at it contemptuously, says the Lord Almighty. When you bring injured and lame and diseased animals and offer them as sacrifices, should I accept them from your hands, says the Lord? 
They were also profaning God's name, it suggests, by saying his service is contemptible and a weariness. I I get tired of doing all this service for God. What's it bring me? Those who continue to bring blemished sacrifices, it says, would fall under God's curse, for he is a great king. Verse 14, cursed is the cheat who has an acceptable male in his flock and vows to give it, but then sacrifices a blemished animal to the Lord. For I am a great king, says the Lord Almighty, and my name is to be feared among the nations. Next, in the first nine verses of the next chapter, of chapter 2. By the way, it's a small book. There's only four chapters. But as we begin chapter 2, Malachi, you can breathe a sense of sigh of relief here, addresses the priest directly. He's talking to the pastors, the, the bishops, the elders, the leaders of the church. And it's a warning to all who lead the people of God in worship today, whether from the the, uh, worship team or the the worship uh, team that serves all of you or myself or anyone here in the pulpit. It goes on in verse 5 to 6, And you will know that I have sent you this warning so that my covenant with Levi, or the priesthood, if you will, may continue, says the Lord Almighty. My covenant was with him, a covenant of life and peace, and I gave them to him. This is called for reverence, and he revered me, and he stood in awe of my name. True instruction was in his mouth, and nothing false was found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and uprightness and turned many away from their sin. For the lips of a priest ought to preserve knowledge because he's the messenger of the Lord Almighty, and people seek instruction from his mouth. Speaking as a pastor, that is a humbling Job instruction for the pastor. Anyone who speaks from the pulpit, who speaks supposedly from the word of God, is the messenger of the Lord God Almighty and needs to be very, very careful what he or she says from the pulpit. It goes on, but you have turned from the way and by your teaching have caused many to stumble. You have violated the covenant with Levi, said the Lord Almighty. So I have caused you to be despised and humiliated before all the people because you have not followed my ways, but have shown partiality in matters of the law. The third charge that Malachi is going to bring on the Israelites is that they were profaning God's covenant that he had made many, many, many years earlier with their forefathers. Malachi 2.10, do we not all have one father? Did not one God create us? Why do we profane the covenant of our ancestors by being unfaithful to one another? How have they done this? Well, the scriptures go on to say that they are marrying heathen women and divorcing their wives. See, God's covenant with his people was very clear that his people would remain faithful only to him. And that was illustrated in the covenant by the husband-wife covenant to remain faithful one to another as well. goes on and says that Judah has been unfaithful. A detestable thing has been committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. Judah has desecrated the sanctuary the Lord loves by marrying women who worship a foreign god. As for the man who does this, whoever he may be, may the Lord remove him from the tent of Jacob, even though he brings an offering to the Lord Almighty. They were defiling the sanctuary. They were defiling the covenant that God had made with them by abandoning their wives divorcing them, and then taking on the wives of the, of the foreign lands, the Gentiles around them. Malachi even prayed the Lord would cut off from Jacob, those who do this. Goes on to say another thing you do. Verse 13, you flood the Lord's altar with tears. You weep and wail because no longer does God look with you on your offerings or accepts them with pleasure from your hands. And you ask why? Well, it's because the Lord is the witness between you and the wife of your youth. You have been unfaithful to her, though she is your partner, the wife of your marriage covenant. Despite their crying out to God, God was no longer regarding their prayers or their sacrifices, for they had dealt treacherously with the wives of their youth. They had abandoned their wives for those around them. Peter discussed this very problem. 1 Peter 3.7 said this, Husbands, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives, and treat them with respect as the weaker partner and as heirs with you of the gracious gift of life so that nothing will hinder your prayers. Any husbands in this midst, I would encourage you to think about that. Are you having a difficult time with your prayer time with God? Could it be because of the way you've been treating your wives, the ones that God has called you to protect, the ones that God has called you to respect? 
2.15 says, Has not the one God made you? You belong to him in body and spirit. And what does the one God seek? Godly offspring. So be on your guard and do not be unfaithful to the wife of your youth. The one God made husband and wife one. And when did he do that? In Genesis it says what happens when a husband and wife are married in matrimony. Genesis 2.24, this is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife. They become one flesh. But even though they'd enter into a covenant, and our covenants usually say, till death do us part. Sadly, I've married a couple couples now, a couple couples, I've married a few couples who have requested that I leave out that phrase, till death do us part. As if they, they've got an out clause there. They can get out before death uh, parts them. But even though God had made them as one couple, they were now unfaithful, it said, to the wives of their youth. Verse 16, the man who hates and divorces his wife, says the Lord, the God of Israel, does violence to the one he should protect, says the Lord Almighty. So be on your guard and do not be unfaithful. Other translations read it this way. Verse 16, for I hate divorce, says the Lord, God of Israel. And him who covers his garment with wrong, says the Lord of hosts. So take heed to your spirit that you do not deal treacherously. So they were profaning the covenant. The fourth charge of Israel was they were trying God's very patience. Malachi 2.17, you have wearied the Lord with your words. How have we wearied him, you ask? By saying all who do evil are good in the eyes of the Lord and he is pleased with them. Or where is the God of justice? See, they had, they had tired God out with their incessant questioning the justice of God. God's response will be to send his messengers. That's where we read this Malachi 3.1 we talked of earlier. I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. Then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant whom you desire will come, says the Lord Almighty. And yes, certainly Malachi is their messenger, but he's talking about two other messengers here. First, the messenger who will prepare his way for him. Most scholars agree this is a clear reference to John the Baptist. You may remember that in Matthew it says, "Then what did you go out to see in the wilderness? A prophet? Yes, I told you, and more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written. So here we have a direct quote from Malachi answering what it is they're talking about. I will send my messenger ahead of you and will prepare your way before you. Malachi, I'm sorry, Matthew 11, 9 to 10. And then he talks about the messenger of the covenant. Christ, the Messiah for which they had longed. He certainly did come to his temple. Remember that? Matthew 21, verse 12. Jesus entered the temple courts and he drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those who were selling doves. But he was also the messenger of a new covenant. When he spoke at the Lord's Supper, he said, this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of their sins. And his coming is going to be to purge his people. They're, they're whining. There's no God's justice. And God's saying, I'm going to bring you justice. Malachi 3, 2-4. But who can endure that day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he will be like a refiner's fire or a launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He will purify the Levites and refine them like gold and silver. Then the Lord will have men who will bring offerings in righteousness and the offerings of Judah and Jerusalem will again be acceptable to the Lord as in days gone by, as in their former years. And just like you have to with fire, refine gold to make it more and more pure. We use fire to refine silver to make it more and more pure. And God is going to use the fire, the refiner's fire, if you will, to make sure that we too are a pure people before him. And with the coming of the messenger of the covenant, they would have to answer the, they would have the answer to their question, where is this God of justice? He is going to come to judge those who do not fear the Lord. So I will come to put you on trial. I will be quick to testify against sorcerers and adulterers and perjurers, against those who defraud laborers of their wages, who oppress the widows and the fatherless and deprive the foreigners among you justice. But do not fear me, says the Lord God Almighty. The fifth charge of the six charges is forsaking God's ordinance. I, the Lord, he says, do not change. 
so you, the descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. But ever since the time of your ancestors, you have turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. But you ask, how are we to return? See, God says he does not change. And the same God who had love for Israel continues to have love for Israel, which is why he has not destroyed them off the face of the earth. But Israel has continually strayed away from him. How? Well, he's going to bring up a case in point. This is not the only way, but here's a way that they have walked away from God with their tithes and offerings. Verses 8 to 9, will a mere mortal rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how are we robbing you? In tithes and offerings, you're under a curse, your whole nation, because you are robbing me. God is saying, look, you, you, you propose to bring me your tithes and offerings. And yet you turn around and deny me those things. And then verses 10 to 12, probably the only verses in Malachi that are quoted frequently and regularly from the pulpit because it says, bring me the tithes, bring me the offerings. And so you'll hear it in churches a lot. But it starts out, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty. And see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing there will not be room enough to store it. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops and the vines in your field will not drop their fruit before it is ripe, said the Lord Almighty. And then all the nations will call you blessed for yours will be a delightful land, said the Lord Almighty. Throughout scripture, over and over again, we have God making the charge, do not test me. But there's one point in Scripture, in all of Scripture, where God says, do test me. And it's right here in Malachi. Test me with these tithes and offerings and see if I will not overflow with blessing. They're challenged to bring the tithes and see the blessings that would follow. And the last charge that he brings are that the Israelites are despising God's service. Verse 13, you have spoken arrogantly against me, says the Lord. Yet you ask, what have we said against you? 14, you have said it is futile to serve God. What do we gain by carrying out his requirements and going about like mourners before the Lord Almighty? But now we call the arrogant blessed. Certainly evildoers prosper, and even when they put God to the test, they seem to get away with it. How many of you have you thought, as you see evil neighbors or um, friends who are cheating the system somehow and getting away with it and saying, God, where, where are you? What benefit is there to following you if the guys who do wrong guys and gals, do wrong, are blessed, and I'm cursed because of following you. They look around, they see evildoers are blessed and prosper, the wicked rise up, they test the Lord and they go unpunished. What good is there in being faithful and service and of service to the Lord? But the word says that there were still some who feared God. Verse 16, Then those who feared the Lord talked with each other, and the Lord listened and heard, and a scroll of remembrance was written in his presence concerning those who feared the Lord and honored his name. And on the day when I act, says the Lord Almighty, they will be my treasured possession. I will spare them, just as a father has compassion and spares his son who serves him. And you will again see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between those who serve God and those who do not. For surely the day is coming, it says, and it will burn like a furnace. All the arrogant and every evildoer will be stubble, and the day that is coming will set them on fire, said the Lord Almighty. Not a root or branch will be left to them, but for you who revere my name, the sun of righteousness will rise with healing in its rays, and you will go out and frolic like like well-fed calves. Then you will trample on the wicked. They will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day when I act, says the Lord Almighty. Those who fear his name will be blessed by Jesus, what is called here the son of righteousness. And until then, the faithful are exhorted to heed the law of Moses and await the coming of Elijah the prophet, who we know as John the Baptist, who will come to prepare people for the coming of the Lord. And the last verses of the last book of the Old Testament read such. Remember the law of my servant Moses, the decrees and laws I gave him at Horeb for all of Israel, See, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the hearts of their children to their parents or else I will come and strike the land with total destruction. 
So what can we learn from the, the prophet Malachi? Malachi teaches us what can happen when we're sliding away spiritually. It's easy to become apathetic apathetic towards the Almighty and justify our own bad behavior. God's people had stopped going to the temple to worship. Those who did gave God the leftovers of their lives and of their love. Their lips formed prayers, but their hearts, their hearts were hardened. They blamed God for everything and themselves for nothing. As with most, most prophets, Malachi had a message for both the present back then and the future right now for us. Malachi's mandate was to call the people of his day and us back to a vibrant relationship with the living Lord. Some of you may have come to Christ in very recent years. Some of you may have been years and years and years ago. For the latter, I would ask you to think back to the, to the, to the day, the week, the month that you discovered Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Remember what that was like, how vibrant your love for him was, how vibrant your expectation of his love for you. And you wanted to tell the world, you wanted to tell your family and your neighbors and your friends and your co-workers, I've got the key to everything that ails you, no matter what's going on in your life, I found it, it's God. But now as time takes over and life takes over and we kind of get a little apathetic in our, in our walk with God. But Malachi is saying we need to give back, get back to that vibrant relationship we once had with him. Their problem, like ours, is not ignorance, but indifference to God. Exhorting the people to look inward, look at how they were guilty and how often we are guilty of the same things. Six charges against the people of God, doubting God's love, dishonoring God's name, profaning God's covenant, trying God's patience, forsaking God's ordinances, and despising his service. But after that, then going on and encouraging the people to look forward to the coming of God's messenger, John the Baptist, who would come in the spirit of Elijah and prepare the people for the coming of the Lord. And then finally, the messenger of the covenant, Jesus Christ, who will come to refine and purify those willing to repent and bring judgment on those who refuse to fear the Lord. We have seen that all these prophets, all 12 minor prophets, in fact, even the major prophets, all had three elements common to them. A judgment was predicted, and then the people were told how they earned that judgment, and then almost without fail, there was always a way out offered, usually by simply repenting of our sins. As we come to the close of this survey of the minor prophets, perhaps it's appropriate to ask, are we willing to take the prophet's message to heart as well? We know that they were written for our learning and our admonition. Romans 15.4 says that. For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. It is through the writings of these prophets that we have hope. They also help us make us wise for the salvation which by, with, by faith in Christ. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Verses 14 and 15. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and become convinced of, because you know that those from whom you learned it, and how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. And Second Timothy goes on to say that they are profitable for instruction in our righteousness. Righteousness just means living the way God wants you to. You want to know to live how God wants you to? The scriptures. Tell us how to do that. Second Timothy three sixteen to 17. All scripture. So that's just the letters from Paul, right? Just the four gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John? No, it's everything. All means, I looked it up in the original Hebrew and, and Greek, and it means everything. So it means all. All scripture is God-breathed. It's useful for teaching and rebuking and correcting and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. I pray that in some way, that for each and every one of us, this series has helped us to appreciate the value of studying the minor prophets, that we won't gloss over them when it comes up in our reading schedule the next time, and that we can apply them to our lives. Malachi has reminded us today that as spiritual priests, we are to offer spiritual sacrifices. And we need to ask ourselves, are our lives honoring to God?
because that's a big thing. It matters not what your family thinks of you. It matters not what your friends think of you, your coworkers, your fellow students. What matters is, are you honoring God? Or do we dishonor God by offering less than our best and giving him half-hearted service at best? Or do we profane God's covenant by disregarding the covenant we made with him? And if we're married by, by uh, disregarding the covenants with the spouses that we married, are we any better than the priests of Malachi's day? We need to let the book of Malachi be a guide as to when one religion is showing signs of spiritual and moral decay. Certainly, the Lord God Almighty is worthy of our very best. And we should do what we can to make sure these words from Malachi 1, verse 11, prove true. For from the rising sun, even to its going down, my name shall be great among the Gentiles. In every place incense shall be offered to my name, and a pure offering, for my name shall be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. Let's go before the Lord God.